in real estate though, never like in an official capacity. And then we built abroad, we did development, stuff like that. Um, but my primary focus was my kids. And then um, in 2015, literally Mark talked me into making a career out of it. Um, and I was very hesitant to make that jump because I'm single and it was a risk for me. And um, he, you know, Mark, um, very positively convincing. So um, it was- You got a, Mark Nottingham. Mark Nottingham. <clears throat> um, but it's been, because I spoke the language um, and understood quite a bit, um, it, was, it was a good transition for me. So five years. And plus the only place I've ever been. Yeah, that's great. And then your family still owns redevelopment group, still in the building business, all that stuff. So um, you know, Micah, of course, was with us for 11 years. And now it's Josh and my brother Josh and my dad. And then they have four other employees at Redev. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thanks, Jamie. Mm -hmm. Tatum, take it away. Right. Um, well, I got into real estate um, two years ago, officially um, joined Platt um, as a new agent as well, just like Jenny um, decided I was interested in real estate about four years ago. Um, board at my job um, at that time, I was working at the state, um, actually in Medicaid, which was really um very different uh, Medicaid policy work, um, kind of like a weird uh, shift in what I had been doing previously, um, but found myself having a little bit of time at night. I was like done with grad school, like just still wanted something to learn um, and decided to buy the random like uh, do it yourself real estate class and did it at home at night. Um, wasn't really sure what would come of it just kind of thought I would take the class and get licensed and then maybe do it but maybe not um fast forward at the time um Maiko wasn't at Redev anymore um as Jenny mentioned he was at Redev for about 11 years left for Micah's a little over husband if that's helpful yes. sorry <laughs> Micah's my husband um Jenny and Mike my husband have known each other longer than I've known either of them so yeah. we're all, <laughs> we're all uh, pretty connected here um, but had left Redev did another kind of stint for a while at Onyx and East actually um, helped create Onyx and East um, and then decided to go out on our, his own um, at the time I was kind of doing some design stuff um, at night with clients and finally decided my job was not a healthy place to be anymore and took the leap and went full-time into our business and then at the time figured it made sense to start at least listing our own compendium builds um, and previously we had been doing that with Mark so had a relationship with Mark um, and just kind of dove right in they graciously welcomed me onto the team um, and yeah, that's what I've been doing. Yeah, that's so good. Thanks, Tatum. Um, guys, I have a ton of questions that I'll be asking these guys. Um, but if you have anything you would like me to add, just drop them in the chat or then there'll be time at the end that you can unmute yourself and ask them yourself. Um, okay, guys, um, can you tell me about um, the real estate process for new builds? Um, like walk me through what's that like um, specifically how is the paperwork different and how is the job of an agent differently different um, when dealing with a new build uh, Tatum you first sure so um, I'll speak I think specifically about something that's not under construction yet because I do think it's different um, it's something you know as a spec build and is one already under construction or two is complete and just on the market but most specifically i think um talking about just brand new there's a piece of dirt someone's interested in building um 
So it does obviously vary from builder to builder, um, kind of a overall like blanket statement, I think here. Um, but for us um, in the world of smaller builder, and I think Redev will probably fall into a lot of this as well. Um, yeah, right, like you gotta figure out the lot. Um, so does the builder own the lot or are you helping your clients locate a lot um, to then build on? I think it's really important to figure out your builder before you find the lot, if at all possible, um, so that you know what can or cannot potentially be built on that lot. Um, then the yeah. process of, yeah. Sorry, off of that, did like each builder have different like capabilities for what they can build or like does each builder have specific specs that like, oh, we only build houses that look like this. Like, can you talk about that a little bit? Um, I think different builders have different things that they will build or are comfortable building. Um, so I can only speak for us um, because for us, you know, we're not super interested in building like an incredibly skinny house. Um, we think a lot of other builders do that really well um, and that works for them. Um, so for us, we say, you know, really a 30 foot lot width is the minimum really for most of our projects, um, unless there's a case by case basis. But it's even, you know, looking at the depth, like do you want an attached garage or a detached garage? Do you want to be in a historic district? Do you want to be in a non-historic um, because there are all different types of guidelines for that and budget is part of that too. Um, so I think that that's a big part of the like early process of working with the builder. Um, and then obviously some builders have their own in-house design people. Um, some builders work with architects and some people have preferred architects. Some people don't care. Um, and then you know, once the plans are finalized, most people actually build out the whole, bid out the whole project, all of their subcontractors and trades. <clears throat> um, and then the specification document, which is like the holy grail of construction. Um, that to me is probably one of my biggest pieces of, of advice for agents um, to receive that and go in depth line by line with your clients on that so that they understand what is included, what is not included. Um, that's like the overarching thing that's gonna guide the process. And if it's not, am I freezing or is Tatum freezing? Tatum is freezing. Everyone. Um, after that, yeah, we do construction loans for 90% of our projects. So I know we're going to talk about that a little bit later, possibly, Rosie. Mm -hmm. I think. Okay, Tatum, we're going to move over to Jenny because you're frozen. Oh, <laughs> uh, okay. I think Jenny, the, take away. one of the things that comes to mind is the differentiation between a custom builder and a, and a production builder. So the experience that you're going to have, and you do not have um, production builders represented here. So Compendium and Redev are both custom builders. So when you go into Pulte, Fishers, you are going to have a very different experience when they say starting price of 250. I mean, that literally does not include overhead lighting. It does not include... <clears throat> So you go through this process then of determining your final price in a very different way, very mechanical. Everything you do, everything you do is an extra cost. Um, in fact, the first time I did a production um, purchase, I was really surprised at how little was actually included. When you have a price with Rita, and that's what Tatum's talking about with the spec sheet, it's important to note that because if you, you know, are seeing that like all of your lighting is included, your appliances are included. So it is important to, to make sure. And then of course you will iron all of the specs out, but that process is very different for production or custom. <clears throat> so it's something to keep in mind. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. 
nope, you go. Um, but then when you get to your final price then, and you have the lot, then you move on to um, determining who's gonna be, well, you usually have this discussion earlier, but the financing, like Tatum says, who carries the construction loan, um, very important differentiation there. Hmm. Yeah, that's helpful. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the spec sheet? Like, what is actually in that? Is there anything specific that agents need to know? Like, oh, God, I really got to make sure that we look at that and make sure it's right. Mm -hmm. I mean, the spec sheet, Tatum does these all the time. I don't necessarily let my brother does that. But um, the spec sheet is going to have details about your level of drywall finish. It should be, a, you know, you want it to be a four. It's going to talk about your window quality. Um, the lighting, um, all of the different mechanicals will be there. Um, and they can be kind of general and kind of broad. Um, they're not going to be um, ultra, ultra specific, but it should be enough details that you shouldn't have surprises. Mm -hmm. um, and probably can answer uh, more of what you should be looking for. Yeah, Tatum, you want to take that away? Except she just disappeared. Except she just left. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> um, yeah, that's okay. Um, Jenny, can you talk more about um, production builders? Like, mm -hmm. tell us what that experience was. I'm guessing you said you did that with clients. Um, what was that process like? Yeah. Um, when I have um, clients looking at a production home with, you know, I think I'm doing one, I'm doing one right now with Fisher, I've done Pulte. Um, there she is. Um, they want you to register your client right away. Um, once you've registered your client, you know, they will make sure that you be, are paid so you can be, you know, confident with that. Um, if your client has registered without you, um, that can be problematic. Um, so you need to make sure that, you know, you're involved. We can talk about that separately. Um, but then when I do a production um, build, I go to every meeting. Um, I definitely, I think the biggest value add is the first two meetings where they are picking um, their upgrades. Like I had clients that literally said in the selections meeting, well, we don't need an egress window in the basement. Well, we want to add a bedroom later, but we'll just skip that and, you know, we'll add it later possible I was like what like the the addition of the egress window in that meeting was like four hundred dollars and to do it later would be like eight grand and you might never seal up your foundation so having a realtor there in that initial meeting is very important the selections um, I think it's more about just being counsel like you know most people can pick their own colors but for me it's about advising them what's important what are you really going to care about down the road so those first two meetings and then um that you know the drywall walk um is important but you know you can't do too much there you might be able to point some things out and then that final blue tape walk uh is important um for, for a realtor to be there as well yeah that's great jenny um tatum can you talk more about the spec sheet? Um, yeah, what's important there? What should we be looking for? Yeah, so on most custom, semi-custom builder spec sheet, it will have line by line, 100% of everything that is included um, in that home that the builder is planning to do. Most builders actually send that spec sheet out to their trades for bidding. So the trades are kind of bidding off of that. Um, and then you know, like, okay, that's where it doesn't say expenses are included, but it has what type of appliance, the model number, um, or it gives the client an allowance for each individual thing. So down to the type of trim and doorknobs, um, all of it. So it's a very specific document um, that you should kind of just think and walking through and thinking through a house um, what should be and shouldn't be included most of it should be there um, and should be standard but it will talk about you know what type of insulation um, what type of shingles is landscaping included is there a fence um, sidewalks 
just kind of some of those things that clients were like, oh, I didn't realize that there wasn't a garage door included or, <laughs> you know, <laughs> things like that. Uh, I'll never forget when I I was representing a client um, at MI and they included a garage door, but not a garage door opener. It's like, what? Huh? Like, okay. Um, but, you know, I never would have known that and neither would my client if we didn't actually like read through this spec document. Yeah. Um, so I just think that's really important. Um, so the purpose of that document is really just to make sure that everything is on there. Totally. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Is there, this is maybe a dumb question, but is there like a checklist that you go off of? Like, I would never be able to look at a spec sheet and just remember like, oh, a garage door opener. Like, do you have a list of like, oh, this, this, this should be included? Or do you just kind of know it? Uh, I think that we could probably put together a generic high level one without um, giving away like specifics to builders, right? Yeah. Um, that at least include the high level level categories. I think that would be fine. What do you think yeah. about that, Jenny? Yeah, I mean, it's things that you should be seeing on there. Um, mm -hmm. And to Tatum's point, that spec sheet is so important. That is what the appraiser will use for mm -hmm. the construction loan. So mm -hmm. think about a construction loan, the appraisal is based on something that doesn't exist. So mm -hmm. the only thing the appraiser has is your blueprint, your, your bid set for all of the drawings and that's including electrical, plumbing, everything's there, um, and then the spec sheet. So an appraiser will take those items and appraise your home based solely on that. They have, that's all they have, right? Mm -hmm. So it, mm -hmm. it is, a, you know, it's very important to have it yeah. all there. All right. That's great. Um, while we're there, let's just go ahead and jump into lending. Um, either one of you can take this, like, tell me, everything I need to know about a construction loan. Well, there's no pressure. two options. You're holding the construction loan or your builder's holding the construction loan. Mm -hmm. So that is incredible. What's the better option for your client, Jenny? Or does it depend? Um, I mean, it's nice if the builder holds it. You don't have to do anything except then it, it, then it becomes just a regular transaction like we do every day. One close at a, with a finished house. It has a little bit different, you know, beginning with the appraisal, like I mentioned, but you have one close at the end. Um, if you hold the construction loan, you're going to be making interest only payments during the loan. Um, your lender will give your builder draws, typically five-ish. I don't know how many you do, Tatum, but I think there's, somewhere in the neighborhood of five draws, typically probably up to nine um, that they will be taking. Um, and the builder has the risk on this. Um, builders build in, build in a, a slush, a contingency. Um, if they go over, it's on the builder. So it feels it's, it's all contracted, you know. So um, a lot of smaller builders, though, um, will ask, you know, a lot of people, the, the actual buyer will hold the construction loan. Do you do most of your own construction loan? Do you hold them mostly, Tatum? Um, no. So I would say 90% of our clients carry their own construction loans. Um, so backing up just a little bit, Michelle, I saw your question. Um, <laughs> construction oh. loans um, are... I like to say like a, a pre-loan versus an end mortgage loan, right? So um, once you have a final contract and all of these specification documents and um, the actual set of plans, you send that to the bank. Um, the actual house, as Jenny mentioned, is appraised on the front end. Um, and then most lenders um, will do a one-time close. So you close on the front end. So before shovels go in the ground, your clients will actually go to the title company. It's just like a normal closing. Um, close on that construction loan. And I like to explain it as it's kind of like a, um, like a line of credit. So say the house is $400,000, mm -hmm. um, you close for $400,000. Um, some lenders, most lenders um, will actually lock in your interest rate on the front end. So that's one of the reasons that it's a big benefit to your clients, especially right now, to carry a construction loan. 
because um, they'll lock in the rate. Um, some are one-time closing, some are two-time closing. So I think that that's really important to ask um, when you're talking about construction lenders and what that looks like. Um, and then as Jenny mentioned, she said the word draw. So at closing, most, um, most builders will take their first quote unquote draw. So what that means is um, if the builder owned the dirt, they'll probably get paid for that dirt at closing. So let's say the dirt was $20,000. That builder will get a check at closing, a wire probably for $20,000 and then like a soft, um, a soft cost draw. Typically that max out around like 5%. Um, so just know that and that's actually to protect your clients to make sure that whatever contractor um, or builder is doing the project isn't pulling out too much money before you know they're actually doing the work. Um, most builders will take a, like a monthly draw. So what that means is they'll say, hey, this first month the foundation got done. Um, we've assigned $40,000 to the foundation. Um, they'll send that to the bank in what's called a draw form request for $40,000. Your client will have to sign off on it that yes, it's got it was done. The bank will actually send an appraiser, um, an inspector out to the site, and title work will get run to make sure that no liens were done um, and to make sure that the foundation is in fact in place. Um, then that money will then go to the builder, and your next payment for your clients will have increased because now they're paying $60,000 in interest. Um, well, interest on $60,000, right? Does that kind of make sense? And we kind of do that. Most builders are on like a monthly-ish draw schedule um, until the end of the project. Um, and then once the home is actually complete, um, that construction loan will get converted to a permanent loan. That's not like Typically, that's not a formal closing unless it's a two-time closing. Um, typically, the lender will show up or even send the documents and have them notarized, um, and then it becomes a permanent loan at that time. Tatum, I know the, the draw system is there to protect your clients, but I'm curious as a builder, like, is that kind of annoying to like have to only get the money in increments? Like, does that... I mean, I know you're probably used to the process now, but like, does that kind of get clunky on your guys' yeah. side? I think it, um, the draw process is why builders have not exclusive lenders, but preferred lenders, right? Because some lenders um, are really, really good at that process and can turn around the money within three, four, five days, and some lenders take weeks. And that is really hard for smaller builders in particular, right? Yeah. yeah. Is there, does it make sense to share preferred lenders or does that not make sense? I mean, First Internet has a pretty I, tight grip. <laughs> yeah. Has a pretty what? Pretty tight grip on the downtown building market. Really? Okay. They're who yeah. you would like recommend yeah. your people go with. Yeah. I actually, we actually send a couple. Um, so Huntington actually mm -hmm. has a really good construction loan program that has a really good program for the clients. Um, and we've used them on the building side um, with no problems at all. Uh, mm -hmm. Quick, which is awesome. We use First Internet Bank. Um, actually, Inglenook up in Zionsville also uses First Internet Bank. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, that's their preferred lender. Um, what, what feels kind of interesting to me, maybe I don't have as good of a read on this, but like it feels like in normal residential purchases, we almost steer people towards a smaller um, bank or, you know, lending institution, but Am I right in thinking like Huntington and First Internet would be larger? First Internet Bank isn't that big. Yeah. Okay. They're both local and that's what matters. You know, oh, okay. National. Yeah. Got it. For some reason, I was like, I think Huntington's national, but no. Okay. Got it. Regional. Cool. 
Huntington's regional, I think. Okay, got it. Um, mm -hmm. Anything else that you guys would say about lending? Any advice that you would give to agents walking clients through the lending process for a new build? Um, I think what Tatum referenced earlier is it can get really tricky if the buyer is trying to buy their own lot and then do a construction loan. That can get tricky. Okay. Um, so it's better if your builder owns the lot? Yeah, because, I mean, it's, it's easier on the client for sure, but whether they can um, do that or not. I just think it's, and Tatum can answer this too, but I think it's a rare client that can find their own lot because typically, I mean, you're going to be paying cash for that, right? So, um, or using a credit line um, to buy that lot. There are situations, though, where you could buy the lot and do the construction loan and pull it all together. Um, it's, I don't know, I, I've, that's tricky. I don't know. If, um, I've, I've never walked through a client as a realtor that is buying a lot and doing a construction loan all in one fell swoop. Um, that's a tricky combo. Yeah, we've had a couple of clients um, do lot loans, actually. Is there, okay. Um, yeah, so there's a couple of different, Centier has a decent lot loan program, um, and so does First Internet Bank. Um, I don't recall Huntington's, I've never had anyone use theirs. Um, it kind of just depends on timing. So like how long do they want to own that lot or like, are they ready to like buy the lot and start construction immediately? Okay. If the latter, then a lot loan doesn't make a ton of sense because it's kind of, I mean, expensive. You're closing twice. Um, you're kind of carrying all of that. So most lot loans are one to two years. Okay. Yeah, I've never, and like most, you know, I've always had clients either buy, pay it in cash or whatever, but yeah, that's good. Mm -hmm. That's good. Um, can you guys talk a little bit about builder warranties? What are those? What do agents need to know about them? Tata, why don't you go first? Sure. Um, so Indiana actually has um, a state mandatory builder warranty. So that's really the, the minimum um, that any builder should be offering to your clients. Um, I like to say it's a one, two, four, ten, one year kind of bumper to bumper, like anything. Um, two year is, um, uh, two year mechanicals. I'm <laughs> sorry. I'm like two years, two years mechanicals. So anything, um, that would go wrong with mechanicals, four year roof, uh, 10 year structural. So think like foundation major things like that. Um, and I mean, we can send out even Indiana code on that. Um, I would say Indiana is actually one of the more strict in that they actually require this of builders, which is good. Um, but some builders go above and beyond. Um, some builders actually sell their warranty after year one to like a national or more regional warranty company that actually they buy that from the builder um we, we don't do that but some do right um yeah and i think like with a production builder this is going to be very different you know they're how and i think for a client they're going to want to know how, i get this question a lot like well how who am i going to call if i have a warranty issue you know so i think that is an important process like if you're working with Pulte or Fisher, they're going to be very specific about how you go about it. A custom builder is going to be like, here's my cell. <laughs> or go ahead and call, um, like I, you know, the, the speech that we give, read it, Compendium gives, is if, you, if it's a warrantied item like your refrigerator, go ahead and just call Whirlpool because I'm just going to call Whirlpool. So, you know, there's some protocol there. One thing I can give pro tip for realtors is when you're writing an offer, say it's a spec build. So spec build, short for speculation. Um, this is a home that a builder has built brand new that they did not sell in the construction pro process. And now it's on the market listed like every other home, but it's brand new. 
So when you buy that, I'm in a deal right now, now with Natalie um, on a spec build for Redev. Um, as a realtor, do not write in the home warranty like you typically do. Um, you know, the $500 limited warranty. Um, that is not necessary because of the state mandated warranty. So what you want to do is some kind of language to the effect of in accordance with the state of Indiana, this, you know, home will receive a warranty from the builder, you know, something like that. Um, but not that section that we normally check where it's limited home warranty for $580, that kind of thing. I have countered that out of a lot of um, spec builds where agents just didn't understand that there's a warranty in place. And I'm actually surprised that a lot of agents don't know that every new home is mandated to have a warranty. So, um, you know, and surprising amount of like skepticism, like I think there are a lot of builders out there that don't make good on their warranties because I've had a lot of people come at me almost, well, very defensively, like, well, how do I know they're going to make good on it? And I'm always a little bit like, what do you mean? Like, and then I've kind of had to realize, well, we hold very true to our warranties. We take them very seriously. So does Compendium, but a lot of builders don't. And then of course, you know, you, you have to sue them. Or So um, I think as you pick your builder, that is a very important question to ask is, you know, how do they carry out their warranties? Um, you know, are their customers satisfied with that kind of thing? That's great. Thanks, guys. Um, what kind of things can you negotiate with builders? I'm sure that, oh wait, um, I'm going to ask, are, are they always transferable, builder warranties? Yes. Yes, Mena, they are. But, um, yeah, you would probably, the part that would be transferable is most likely the, the roof and the structure, right? Because most people are going to not move within the first year. Mm, that's great. Um, you guys, Natalie's question, would that warranty apply to a teardown, um, but with an old foundation and or a full gut to the studs rehab? Most, mostly not. Those are not considered new construction um, if they have a foundation there. Um, now I have, I sold a house last year um, where it was virtually that exact thing and the builder did provide a full builder warranty. Um, I'd never seen anyone do that before, though. Hmm. Okay, good to know. Us too. Yeah. So I mean, it's it's they. I mean, it's great. You know, um, they should. But most, you know, it's just like when we put it in the BLC. If it, that foundation's still there, we have to write it nine. It was built in 1912, even if it was gutted to the studs. Um, my my listing on Brookside is a perfect example. It was an actual burnout, literally down to the foundation. There, you know, there's not a they didn't even spare a stud, I don't think. But um, oh, um, it was my ask, Natalie's asking who did that. Um, it was my his name is John, um, and it was my um, sale on Forty Second Street. So I can I can um, I can send it to you, Natalie. Um, Natalie, um, I think most people would do a one year instead of the full one, two, four, ten. Yeah. And you're saying what can be negotiated? Yeah, what can be negotiated with builders? Um, and I'm sure, like, can you talk a little bit, like, I'm sure it depends on where the builder is at in the process. And then is there a difference in that between custom and production? Yeah. Um, well, I like to say everything is yes if you want to spend the money. <laughs> I mean, you can do just about anything if you want to pay for it. But as far as negotiation, I mean, the things like, you know, for a builder that are relatively easy to do for them, um, you can add a fence, sometimes landscaping, um, you know, sometimes upgrades if the, the house is done. Um, if the house is not done, it very much depends on where it is in the, in the process. You know, if you're already drywalled, they're not you know, moving walls and things like that. I mean, yes, it can be done, but it's going to have a price tag associated with it. Um, one thing that I, um, I, 
you know, Compendium might do, I think Compendium does um, a little bit of a tax credit. Um, read it, the thing about the tax credit, and a lot of people get confused about this. Um, it's in our PA that for new construction, um, and you can check that box and then you give them a tax credit. Um, I've gone at length with my father about this conversation. He's like, why do I, why do I have to pay those taxes? And I'm like, uh, I don't know, because it's a box on my PA. <laughs> and he was like, and the whole concept is, and we, we all know, we get it, taxes are paid backwards. So the builder is building a house on a lot and there's zero, very little taxes, right? Well, then once you sell the property, it will get reassessed and the taxes will kick around. Well, the first whatever payment, maybe two payments, they're going to have very little taxes and you're most likely going to get an escrow check back from your bank um, and so you're going to get this you know two thousand three thousand dollar check and you're like Woo well guess what's going to happen the next year when they assess you and fix your taxes and correct them to where they should have been the whole time is you're going to get hit well this tax credit is supposed to soften that blow right so that you don't get hit well Basically, you're asking the builder then to future date and pay your future taxes so that you don't have that kickback, that whiplash. It doesn't really make tons of sense in, from the builder's perspective. Like, why would the builder do that? So what we tell our clients is, listen, you're going get, to like, get away with really low taxes for a little while. You're going to get a refund check, and then it's going to come back and catch up with you. So rather than send that escrow check, save it and be aware that it's going to kick around because we do our taxes backwards. So that's one thing that a lot of people negotiate, um, but we don't necessarily um, provide that anymore. So I don't know. Um, so yeah, negotiations. Um, prices, um, you can negotiate a little bit with prices um, depending on the builder. With Redev, they don't really overinflate the prices that much because Indian doesn't either. So, you know, your prices are kind of their fixed costs kind of thing, but um, they can be negotiated a little bit. What do you think, Lou? Um, so I admittedly have only had two production clients. Um, so I'm by no means an expert. Um, I think there are a lot of other agents on the call that are probably far more suited. <laughs> Uh, to answer that question, um, I haven't, I mean, I've had some luck. So of those two, actually one was a new build and one um, was actually under construction. So the one under construction with the production builder, we actually, we weren't able to change anything, which was a little frustrating, um, even though it like finishes hadn't been installed yet, but we were able to negotiate quite a bit on price. Um, that was with, uh, I don't remember off the top of my head, but it'll come to me, um, in Noblesville. And then the other was with MI. Um, that was a new build. Um, we negotiated on closing costs um, and an upgrade. Um, but I think that that even has gotten harder and harder with them from what I've heard recently. That was about a year and a half ago, maybe two years now. Um, a year and a half. So I think you know, it just kind of depends on production builder um, and kind of where they are in that development as well. Right, the less homes that they have to be sold, probably the less likely they are now to be willing to throw in things um, and make it work. Um, from a more custom perspective on negotiation and, you know, I think that, as Jenny said, I think that they're actually ways to be creative about negotiation um, and having your clients feel like it's a win um, while also working with <laughs> the builder um, and knowing that, you know, a lot of small builders don't, as Jenny said, have just this like, oh, well, we priced it $20,000 over in anticipation of someone lowballing. Um, that's not really how it typically works for most of us. But there are things like site built built-ins that don't actually cost that much money um, once someone's 
already, like the trim guy is already there um, and is already doing the work. Some of those kind of things, like adding some additional paint colors, um, the painter's already there. It's not that much money. Um, some of those kind of small wins. Um, negotiating, as kind of Jenny mentioned, if it hasn't been built yet on, you know, different decisions, um, different finishes, having, making sure that the client feels like they're, you know, really a part of some of that decision making process. Um, and then I think that there are opportunities to be creative around um, like how you structure closing costs um, or just things like that. Construction loans are a little bit more expensive. So um, sometimes clients, especially if it's like their first house, um, just don't have as much money to bring to closing. Um, and so thinking, you know, creatively with the builder, like, okay, well, you know, the number might still be the same, but will you all pay for it on the front end and get the draw on the back end? Um, so I think just thinking about strategically instead of maybe just like the final like number, like, okay, did I negotiate $10,000 off the price or is my client getting a lot more potentially for that $10,000? Um, which is kind of maybe a different way of thinking. That's great guys. Um, I'm curious, I didn't prep you with this question beforehand, so sorry, um, but is there is there an advantage to building over buying an existing house or a disadvantage? Um, like, would there ever come a time that you would encourage your clients, um, like saying like, hey, I actually think like a new build might be a better option for you. Like, can you talk a little bit about that? Um, I just um, walked clients through um, I was, we've been looking at existing homes for two years. They were this close to um, buying a home and they were remodeling it in their minds. And next thing I knew, they had said $200,000 <laughs> in what they were wanting to do, talking about moving the front door. And I was like, hey guys, <laughs> you're going to price yourself out of the market. And they ended up building. Um, they were just, every home that we were going in, they were remodeling it in their minds, you know no kitchen was ever good enough and you know the houses that they did want you know were you know that would have had the nice kitchen were way too big so i think there are some people that are really specific another thing that was really beneficial is they're going to have plenty of time now because of the build process they're going to plenty of time to get their current place ready um there's not going to be any surprises so i think there are times um when it's really beneficial to build uh, I mean I think our um, shortage of inventory is definitely um, pushing some people like I just have I have another set of clients that I mean they have been looking and looking and looking and they just can't they're like I think we're gonna need to build you know so um, a lot of people are afraid of the building process um, they don't want to go through it um, they don't want to make all the selections it's a lot of work um, even even for me when I built my own home um, I literally told Emily at Redev, I said, don't show me things out of my price range because I know I, I know I have expensive taste. I know it looks good and I know I will pick the most expensive thing. Don't show them to me because, so, you know, I think, um, it's a daunting process, but I think for some people, um, that can't find what they want, um, it can be really beneficial. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, that's perfect. Tatum, anything to add? Yeah, I think I'll actually take the like opposite um, approach here. Like maybe when would it make sense for someone to build, right? So um, I think we all maybe like know this, but maybe our clients don't. Like it is almost always going to be more expensive to build a new home. Um, new homes are at a premium on price. Um, you do get the warranty, right? Like everything's new um you're paying for labor prices and material prices of today not of 10 years ago um like it's just more expensive to build an, a new house a lot of the time so i think knowing that and like being very upfront making sure our clients understand that um i mean we have that conversation with clients all the time that come to us and 
you know, are looking at an existing house or new construction and um, same square footage, I'm like, well, you know, ours is going to be more expensive. Um, lot prices are just so much more expensive now, um, especially right now downtown. Um, I think we all know that. Um, supply and demand has definitely taken over there. Um, and so I think that that's a really important conversation. And then um, just timelines. So building can can be a long process. <laughs> um, I think most most builders probably quote between five to six months from the time the shovels go in the ground, Diane. Um, that doesn't account for what happens before that though. Um, before that could be three months, it could be a year. It just depends on how quickly clients can make decisions. Um, the architect, the plans, kind of all of it. I think everybody's busy right now, um, which is a great thing, but things are just kind of taking a little bit longer than normal. Um, so I think if your client has a really strict timeline, building may not always be the best option. Um, and then, yeah, as Jenny mentioned, the selections in the detail process. Um, some clients just don't want to or have the time to commit to building. Um, and, you know, they're building because they want it to be theirs and they want to, like, make some of those decisions or there are things that they haven't been able to find. But then if it's more stressful for them to make the decisions, that's kind of hard, too. Yeah, yeah, that's great. I'm looking at Natalie's question. Um, I think that 10 to 20 year old home, um, I think that can be kind of a rough time because 10 to 20 years, a lot of people have not done much upgrading. So if you have a 10 year old home, 20 year old home, maybe it's the original furnace. Um, maybe, you know, so that's kind of that middle ground, but your roof is still gonna be good. Your sewer line's not gonna be clay. Um, so I think it kind of depends on maintenance of both of those, like a very old home that's been remodeled, like that might have clay sewer and a brick foundation, but it might have an all new kitchen. So I think, I don't know, um, I struggle with, um, and I had another agent ask me, they did a gut renovation and I mean, high end gut renovation. And he like listed over the price of the new builds in the area because it's historic and gorgeous. And I'm like, boy, that is tricky. That is really tricky to have um, a remodeled home go over the price of a new build. Um, because you have to really think about, I always think about what can my client buy for the same money, right? And yes, they love that historic look and the wood, but they also have, you know, perfect layout, perfect floor plan with, you know, perfect, but, you know, completely modern and all these things. So um, I think it's tricky when you see some of these historic um, high-end remodels because it's expensive to remodel a historic home, preserving the wood and, and floors and the trim. Um, you know, a lot of them, it, it, be, it would be cheaper to build new, but then of course you lose all the character. So um, I think it's tricky when they go over that price of the new builds in the area. Is that your question, Natalie? It is. Okay. Um, also, how old can a house be and still be comparable to a home that was built in the current year? Does that make sense? Like, let's say, let's say a redev house that was built in 20... 16 2017 got listed today mm -hmm. in theory it's going to sell for a little less money than something built brand new today but how much less does that make sense yeah i, I think yeah i feel like eight to ten years might be that threshold when it starts getting over 10 years old i think people are going to start being like okay it's kind of new um but yeah i think if you're in that young, newer than seven kind of years um, I think it could be pretty comparable. A lot of it has to do with how dated it is. You know, if it had, you know, because I've been in some houses that are five years old, and I'm like, you cannot tell. Um, like, you cannot tell that this home was built um, that many years ago. Like, the, the selections are still very current. So it has a lot to do with what it looks like and if it was maintained. 
What are you thinking? Yeah, I probably would have said less time than you, Jenny. Um, I think the warranty is part of that um, with some things. Um, but yeah, I think finishes are probably a big part of that um, because as we all know, over the last I don't know, five, six, seven years, I mean, most of the lots are about the same downtown in size, right? Anywhere between 30 to 40, unless you're in a historic neighborhood with a bigger lot. You can only build a rectangle so many ways. Um, so if you're, I say that all the time. Um, so if you're moving, you know, if you're looking at a side by side, Natalie, of like uh, a compendium house that's 2,400 square feet that was built in 2016 versus 2020. Um, I love that question because I have that question. Um, you know, I know that this actually happened like not that long ago. Um, <laughs> same street, um, almost the same layout, um, both unfinished basements. Um, and to me, right, it's like, okay, what are the clients now looking at? Like now they're looking at the finishes to know like, does this fit what I want to do or am I going to have to move in? and do something to make it feel like it was built in 2020 if that's what I want. So I don't know what the exact dollar amount is. Um, I think it's a really good question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Um, guys, does anyone else on the call, you're welcome to unmute yourself and ask questions or drop anything else in the chat. Anyone got anything before we finish up? We answered them all. Yeah, it sounds like it. Um, okay. Perfect. Um, Jenny and Tatum, thank you so much. Your guys' um, expertise is really appreciated, and thanks for sharing your knowledge. That was incredibly helpful. Yeah, good to see everybody. Yeah. Um, guys, yeah. <laughs> guys, tomorrow um, we are going to be joined by Josh Robertson. He's a real estate lawyer. Um, and he'll be sharing a bunch of things about how to not get yourself in trouble. So, um, yeah, I hope you can join. Um, and then, of course, we have um, the Coronavirus and Book Club call later today at 3. So, hope to see you guys. Have a good one. Bye. Bye, guys.